Well, I want to say welcome to you. My name is Leslie Hunter, and thank you for coming to Civ Energies Davis City Council Candidate Forum. And I really want to thank the candidates for participating with our online website and for being here today. After the forum, we are going to have a reception catered by Three Ladies Cafe, and then you'll have an opportunity to visit each candidate's campaign table. And now I would like to introduce Bob Fung. Uh, so uh, thanks to Leslie, uh, she's the one who uh, organized the forum, uh, and uh, she did a great job, I think. So, um, and thank to, uh, thanks to all of you for coming out on a, uh, a Sunday afternoon. Um, uh, we're all very uh, uh, energetic here in Davis about our politics, and I think this, this uh, shows that. I want to thank the candidates for coming out and for their energy and, uh, uh, and their participation uh, in the civic process. And I want to thank uh, uh, Davis Community Church uh, for allowing us to use this uh, facility. Uh, uh, my, my wife and I are, uh, have been members here for 30 years. We remember when this was built and uh, we've been here many, many times for many different things, uh, fundraisers, uh, church events, and it's uh, just a great, great facility. Um, I just want to say a few things about uh, Civ Energy. Uh, we're a relatively new organization, and uh, we're, it's a nonpartisan, not-for-profit uh, organization. It's an experiment in democracy to try to get voters uh, the information they need uh, to make a good voting decision as quickly as possible. You know that uh, nationally that uh, there's uh, a lot of money going into uh, campaigns, which, are, which is, uh, you know, sort of messing with voters' minds. And uh, we are trying to get voters straight information directly from the candidates. Um, and so that, and uh, for this uh, election period, for this election uh, a cycle, uh, Les Leslie and I are working together to try to work on putting the online candidate forum that we have at the Civ Energy website together with um, uh, traditional events like this candidate forum. Uh, to, and we, we want, we know that uh, making a decision is more than just hearing the candidates talk about issues. We want you to uh, uh, meet with the candidates, shake their hand, hear them uh, talk with you about uh, the things that are important to you. Um, so, um, and um, so uh, we have nine candidates for two spots. Um, so we had to be, think pretty creatively about uh, how this forum would be, uh, be uh, uh, designed because there's not that much time with, with nine candidates. We have a program. Uh, we, we printed out uh, 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 several copies of the program. Uh, a number of copies which we're out of now, but if you go to the Civ Energy website uh, to the first entry, um, uh, which, which is the description of the event, there's a link there uh, uh, on that page which leads you right to the program and you could just download it uh, in PDF format or whatever you want to do and uh, look at it after the forum. Uh, in that program, there are, are seven um, yes or no short answer questions uh, about uh, uh, that, that, that all the all the uh, candidates have uh, answered. Um, uh, the we're, we're going to be asking the candidates to answer, um, uh, give give an opening statement and a closing statement, and uh, three we're going to ask them three questions, which are designed to uh, for for you to hear how they think. So um, that's the that's our design for the for the forum. Um, Ann Evans uh, uh, is uh, uh, going to be the moderator for this uh, forum. She's the former mayor of Davis, and uh, she uh, was a city council member for um, uh, two terms. Um, she recently uh, wrote a revised version of the uh, Davis, Farmers, uh, Davis Farmers Market Cookbook, um, and some of, uh, two of the uh, things being served today um, uh, are from recipes from her cookbook. So uh, thank you, Ann, for being the moderator today. 
Just want to say hi to everybody. I'll have my back to you most of the time because I'm asking the questions of the candidates, but welcome. Thank you for your interest in Davis and its civic life. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. Um, so good afternoon. There will be five rounds of questions. The first and last rounds, you will have one minute to respond, and the second, third, and fourth rounds, you will have two minutes. Mark Eggleston here will be timing and will be showing you your remaining time. Green with half the time to go, yellow, 15 seconds to go, and red at five seconds. Any questions? So please respect all of our time and end when you're looking at the red. Okay, and uh, names were drawn out of a hat of how we start first, and we'll, each of you um, will we'll be rotating along. So we're going to start with Mary Jo Bryan. The first question, one minute, is um, to provide an opening statement. As, okay. My name is Mary Jo Bryan, and I have 44 years of experience working and volunteering in Yolo County and in Davis. I've served as an executive director of a non local nonprofit agency and worked in local government as an aide to former supervisor Helen Thompson. I was past president and member of the League of Women Voters studying governmental issues and implementing solutions. I was program coordinator for the Yolo County Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs, and most recently, I advocated for single story housing for seniors and persons with disabilities and fought to the bitter end to try to save the family's first uh, campus for the citizens of Davis. As a retiree, I am able to devote full time to the Davis City Council and you. Thank you. Dan Carson. My name is Dan Carson and I'm running for City Council to preserve the quality of life and the core values of sustainability, education, and family we share as Davis residents. I'm prepared to do this job today. After a career as an investigative reporter covering state and local government, I went back to UC Davis and got my MBA. I then worked for 17 years as a fiscal and policy analyst for the state legislature. My, as deputy, I was responsible for health care, social services, criminal justice, transportation, uh, uh, energy and environmental policy, and in retirement, I'm your chair of the Finance and Budget Commission. My focus, as if you elect me, is to resolve an $8 million a year fiscal gap that, that could ruin our roads and our parks. And I want to focus on creating a new and better relationship with UC Davis so that we can work together to deal with, with housing, traffic, and parking problems. 150 Thank you, Dan. 150 people have endorsed me. Thank you very much. Linda, Linda Dios. Hello there, I think. Hello there. My name is Linda Dios. I am a consumer protection attorney and a small business owner. I have 30 plus years of public service and I currently serve on the Davis Personnel Board as well as the Yellow County Health Council. This service, along with my 20 years of negotiating contracts, mediating complex settlements, and managing budgets, gives me the experience to serve and lead this community. My focus is going to be on building entry-level housing for our families, our seniors, and our students. Fixing our crumbling roads, bike paths, and sidewalks. Diversifying our revenue sources by encouraging economic development. Solutions to these issues require independence, the strength to say no to proposals that are not in the best interest of our whole community and to say yes to those that do. Thank you, Thank Linda. You. Eric Goods. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Goods, and I want to thank you all for taking your time to be here with us this evening. I'm running for Davis City Council, very simply, because I feel that it should be just a little, little bit easier for folks in my generation and all generations in Davis to be able to access, live, and breathe the Davis dream that we all know and love. There's a reason why every single one of us came here to Davis, settled in Davis, and wanted to make our homes in Davis. But right now, we have so many of us, thousands of us, that are not able to access the Davis dream. Whether it's affordability in our housing, whether it's lack of uh, accessibility with our job market, economic development, or a lack of community resources, our town 
is struggling, and there are many that are unable to attain the Davis dream. So my focus as your public servant on the Davis City Council is to ensure that each and every one of us has access to the Davis dream and can fulfill our vision of wanting to be part of this community for Thank now you, and ever. Thank you. Larry Gunther. Hi, I'm Larry Gunther. Um, thanks to everyone for coming out, uh, for Leslie and Bob, and for all the candidates for stepping up. What I'm gonna bring to the Davis City Council, if elected, is a strong, independent voice for neighborhoods and for community groups in the decision-making process. As a small business owner, what I do is listen to my clients and problem solve within their budget. Helping my clients realize their vision while doing this, that's what I do. I want to listen to our commissions and our community groups, increasing transparency, accountability, and trust are cornerstones of what I want to achieve. Fortunately in Davis, the heart of our process is community-based commissions with intelligent, problem-solving people. I want to respect the recommendations of those commissions and our community groups and all the stakeholders involved. And this is what I do every day. Thank As you, Larry. Okay, I thought he said five. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your kindness there. Gloria Partida. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming out today and thank Civ Energy. Um, I'm Gloria Partida and I've lived in Davis since 1989. I've been an activist since my own high school walked out in a decade that I'm not going to disclose. <laughs> I'm running for Davis City Council because I'm committed to building community. I believe communities belong to the people that live in them. And the people that live in Davis are diverse. We are young, we're old, er, multicultural, and our neighborhoods are extremely unique. The uniqueness of Davis can only be preserved by remaining fiscally solvent, economically strong, and by providing housing for all. And I am committed to working hard to bring out the best in Davis. Thank you, Gloria. Luis Rios. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Luis Rios. It's great to be here today with all of you. Um, this is an exciting time here in Davis. I'm here with my two children and my wife. I'm here with my campaign team, UC Davis College students, who have been working very hard and support me as I, I run for, for office. I was born in Davis and grew up in Yellow County. I come from a working class labor household. I learned from my father the value of hard work, ethics, friendships, and integrity. He also taught me about Cesar Chavez, and I have a, a quote from Cesar Chavez. We cannot seek achievement for ourselves and forget about progress and prosperity for our community. Our ambitions must be broad enough to include the aspirations and needs of others for, the sakes, for their sakes and our own. And that's why I'm running for Davis City Council. Thank you, Luis. Mark West. Good afternoon, I'm Mark West. I came to Davis in 1959 when my parents brought me home from the hospital. Um, I have a very long view of what's going on in Davis and I recognize the challenges that we face today. Some of them have been in, in place for a long time. I'm running as city council because I want to directly address those challenges instead of pushing them off for other generations. So the two that I think I'm going to focus on are our fiscal challenge and our housing shortage. Fiscal challenge I want to address through economic development, increasing opportunity for everybody to improve their quality of life. And that housing challenge I want to address primarily through multifamily high density housing because that's the shortage that we have in town. 50% of our community are renters and we have an absolute shortage of apartments available for them to live in. Those are the two things that I want to address, and I thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ezra Beeman. Thank you. My name is Ezra Beeman. I was born and raised in the area, I'm fifth generation, uh, and I've returned to Davis to raise my children here. I moved out of the area uh, to get my degree um, in uh, philosophy and economics from Claremont McKenna, uh, and then I moved overseas uh, for my professional career living in uh, Paris and uh, uh, Sydney, Australia. 
um, where I worked for the utility there. I returned to Davis with my three children as they approached school age because I really loved growing up in this community uh, and I wanted my children to, to grow up in this community as well. I'm running today because I want to be an advocate and support the progressive ideals and thinking that I think have made this a truly remarkable community. Um, I think my, the values I share with this community having grown up there, um, my educational qualifications which also include a master's in finance, um, and my experience founding two businesses and working for a large organization um, will help me make a difference on the council. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Okay, this is the second question and the candidates did receive this question in advance. The uh, final two they did not. Okay, and could the candidates please speak directly into the microphone because we're doing a recording of this. Thank you, and be sure that you're looking over at Mark from time to time with the, um, the red, green, and yellow. Okay, uh, you will have two minutes to answer this question, and we will beginning, be beginning with Linda Dios. Economic development is key to the future of Davis, being able to provide community services to its population. Sacramento has declared itself the farm to fork capital of America. And within that context of farm to fork capital of America, Woodland has chosen to create food front on its main street and invest in infrastructure related to attracting food processors. Winters has become known for its innovative restaurants and redeveloped the downtown to feature them. West Sacramento is attracting brew pubs and is investing in a vision of becoming a global food hub. And UC Davis is a powerhouse of knowledge on food and agriculture. What are your thoughts for ways in which the city of Davis can develop a unique food identity which contributes both culturally and economically to the city? And we'll begin with Leah. Linda. Thank you. Is this close enough? Okay. A couple of things I think we need to focus on, and one of them is to the point of building community downtown so that it's a downtown area that I want to come to that attracts me and attracts others to eat downtown, to play downtown, to drink coffee downtown, drink wine downtown. That's lacking now. Think of it. When we want to go out to dinner, want to go and have a special birthday dinner, anniversary dinner, more often than not, I'm driving across that causeway to Sacramento. I'm going to up to Winners. I'm going to other places because we don't have what all of us can have downtown here. In that, it's wonderful that we have so many ethnic restaurants, so many cafes, so many things that are oriented to you know going in fast, picking up the food, and leaving. What we don't have are sit-down restaurants. I would like to encourage more of that downtown. Think of that. Why do we go to Europe? Why do we go to other places? We love the idea of the piazzas, of the small community, of being a small community, of being a place where we can walk from here to there. I want to foster that downtown. Wider sidewalks, more pedestrian friendly. Think of the alleys that we have. Think of, my gosh, what's the big one? Tim Spencer Alley that's going through a renovation right now. I'm envisioning bistros there. I'm envisioning small tables sitting out with trees having a canopy going over, be it the sails or the lights, thinking of that alley in San Francisco that attracts folks to it. Secondly, I want to be looking at building our relationship with UC Davis. That is, was brought up. It is the number one in agriculture, number one in plant sciences and vets, vet sciences. We have the Robert Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science. Let's bring their tasting room of olive oil, honey, wines downtown let's bring folks here let's see more of that cooperation between uc and the city thank you linda eric thank you so much for this question um so one of the biggest issues with why we are seeing a significant barrier um, and a significant impediment for us being able to foster more um, of our of our culinary and creative scene downtown is very simply because 
the young professionals in our community and the creative class in our community are simply not able to afford to live in Davis. They are moving to West Sacramento and starting their bistros there. They're moving to Woodland to start their work there. They're going to Winters. They're going to Sacramento. They're going to the bay. Going to the bay. I can't tell you how many hundreds and thousands of my friends have moved out of this community and are not coming back. And these are the kinds of folks that we need to be able to retain in Davis. We need to be able to keep them employed and keep them working within our communities. So first and foremost, what we need to do is we need to be able to find ways to get our young professionals in our creative class plugged back into our communities. Um, and this is something that I hear a lot talking to some of the downtown restaurants and I'm out canvassing walking doors is that they're feeling the pinch, that they're feeling that particular issue with their workers and folks that are trying to fill their restaurants that are having to commute out of Davis. They're having to commute from Sacramento, from the Bay even to, to come to Davis, right? And that's putting a strain on parking. It's putting a strain on workers' rights and, and, and wage laws. It's putting a strain on our customer base. We're not bringing enough dollars downtown and all of that is affecting our ability to be the next food to forecast capital and to compete with the greater region in that regard. So I think first and foremost, we need to work on the people and we need to make sure that our creative class and our working class is able to survive and thrive in Davis. Thank you, Eric. Larry. Um, hi. So the question, yeah, it ended with the uh, University of California, Davis, and we've got that right here. They've got, they've got the food thing kind of all wrapped up regionally, and coordinating with them and expanding on what we already have, the, the advantages we already have. It's been done. So as my, uh, one of my major advisors used to say, uh, if it did happen, it can happen. We have a master brewer program that started at the university um, with Charles Bamforth and, and, suit, and cooperating with suit work, doing more of that. We've, We've got one in a, in a university with a town full of creative people. Uh, we've got a farmer's market that is literally world famous. Um, tabling at the farmer's market, you talk, or just walking around, you talk to people who are coming from the Midwest, the East Coast, coming, they're visiting from out of the country, and they're coming to the farmer's market. So we've already got a lot of the infrastructure that we need to do this. The thing that I think that we can focus on that, again, Davis has in, in excess almost <laughs> that the other cities mentioned don't have is our international configuration, our international populace. We've got the university. We've got people who come to Davis for a variety of reasons and stay for kind of one reason. It's a really great place to live. So capitalizing on that, capitalizing on the creativity, the problem solving, and the international aspect of the people who come here can go a long way toward cooperating with the university, with the city, city businesses with people. I mean, we've got a lot of university, or a lot of restaurant businesses that could take a menu from an individual and try it out. Thank you, Larry. Gloria. Okay, so recently I was at work and we were having a conversation because we discovered that there is a bike bus. And the advertisement for the bike bus was, you know, take this bike bus with your friends and do wine tasting. And we thought, where would you go? Um, because I can't think of too many places that are sort of geared towards wine tasting. And I think that the problem that we have is that we, um, that we don't have a cohesiveness. So it's, we have a lot of great places to eat. Uh, as people have said here, we don't have too many places where they will come and take your menu and, or, or take your order and you can sit down and have sort of a relaxed place to, to have dinner. There are a lot of older people who feel that the restaurants are sort of geared towards the, the younger people in town. And uh, you know, business people are smart. They know that that is a large demographic, but there is other opportunity that I think we are missing. And while I think that a great deal of the effort should be downtown because we want to com 
uh, continue the vibrancy we have there. There are other places that people live in Davis, and there are other centers that we have, and there's West Davis, there's uh, South Davis. There are places that people can get to close to their neighborhoods, and I think that we miss the opportunity to sort of invest in, in those spaces where people can go. And um, the thing with the bike bus is an excellent way for us to meld two of the things that, we're that we have an identity with. We have an identity with food because of the Mondavi uh, Institute, Food Institute, and also because we have the farmer's market. We are also known for our bikes, and so uh, Sacramento has a bike crawl. I think we can, we can do that here as well. We have to meld, we have to coalesce, we have to sort of be more um, coordinated in our efforts. We can pair our food with our arts. Thank you, Gloria. Luis. The, uh, the Davis downtown area has a lot of potential. I remember last summer uh, we celebrated my son's birthday party in downtown uh, with four or five of his friends, families. And so we went to Woodstock's, and afterwards we went to um, Ice Cream, and then we waited for a movie. It was called Captain Underpants, I think. <laughs> uh, so that was good. Um, so that was my first, one of my first um, encounters with downtown more closely, uh, besides Watermelon Music mo moving to West Davis, but um, um, there's empty storefronts, there's more, there's so much potential in downtown Davis, I could definitely see the East Street Plaza uh, being resurfaced. Uh, be, it's like the heart of this of Davis, really, um, having more lawn, trees, more bringing in businesses, supporting local businesses. I, I see the Varsity Theater, the old City Hall building, those can be used as anchors to build and develop from, from there. Um, I had the opportunity to meet the Chancellor Gary May and his administration. We definitely need to work on partnerships and and building on relationships. It starts from there. That's how you get things done. Um, during my freshman year, I lived in Tercero, which is right across from the cows. And so I thought of uh, when Bob sent us this question about, um, let's see. Um, some food identity. So I thought of uh, the Davis Organic Shake or the Aggie Organic Smoothie or the Smoothie and Ag and there's acronyms that go, go along with those, uh, DOS, AOS, SA. So we can definitely market a product mutually in partnership to begin with. It's a lot of potential. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Mark. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Davis already has a pretty vibrant downtown. If you walk around downtown, there, there's a lot of things going on. The challenge that we have is that there's not a lot of good restaurants that we can sit down and have a, have a fine meal at. And the primary reason for that is because the community doesn't have enough people who appreciate fine restaurants to go out and support those places. So they end up, we have one or two come in, they have uh, survived for a few years, and then they close down. We need to be, as a community, more supportive of our downtown food uh, environment. We also need to bring more people living downtown so that they can walk downstairs or next door to the restaurant rather than having to drive in from out the outskirts and try to find a place to park and all the other challenges. So I think we need to take an example from our neighbors who are the work that they're doing. Winters talked about bringing in new restaurants or creating new restaurants and redeveloping, and we need to do the same thing. But our redevelopment, because we're a larger city and we have different challenges, needs to be mixed-use construction with apartments over the top of, of commercial throughout our downtown so that we have people living downtown and being a part of that community. And if we do that, we'll, we'll grow the food entity as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ezra. So. Business development is what I do. I it. Sorry, business development is what I do professionally. I help businesses identify growth opportunities, position themselves, and establish plans to move into that space and operate successfully. And so I would tackle this question by first of all, like any good marketer, understanding 
what the nature of demand is, what do people want to eat? Then I would look at where is the competition positioning? And that helps identify what are the gaps in the market. The next thing you need to think about is what is our strategic or competitive advantage? Um, some of it was already um, uh, spoken of. Uh, we have UCD. Um, we're also a very uh, sustainable um, agriculture focused community. Um, so that brings to mind things like uh, a focus on organic food or a focus on things like wine. Um, just anecdotally, when I was in Australia and I said I came from uh, Davis, they said, where is that? And I said, well, um, it's where we educated all your best winemakers. Um, I think the roles, I think the role for the city though uh, is similar to a country in developing their strategic, um, their strategic industries. Uh, and that's where the city could look to remove the barriers for businesses to establish themselves and to also promote on a common basis um, the, uh, the uniquely Davis um, food offerings. I would say though, Davis has got some phenomenal food uh, right now. I mean, I love going to Poke, I love going to Dos Coyotes, I love going to Chickpeas, for example, uh, and we go to fine dining around Davis all the time. And when I'm overseas, I miss Davis. It's one of the few places I can actually eat um, close to a vegan uh, diet, uh, and I can't do that in Sydney or Paris or other places. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Mary Jo. My thoughts regarding this question comes from a discussion with a USC Davis extension, a cooperative extension professor emeritus. He is interested in uh, telling the history of the many different culturals, cultural communities that have made California agriculture what it is today. He wants to bring these stories to the university community. I want to share my thoughts on how to use his ideas to bring the stories to Davis agricultural heritage into the city of Davis. There are some amazing panels at Turlock's rest stop on Highway 99 that depict agricultural workers. Using this idea for telling a story, we discuss the construction of large historical signs or panels to capture the historic and contributions of many cultural communities that have been major players in the development of our agricultural system. He would have the panels placed on permanent basis throughout the UC Davis campus. And I thought this project could extend into the downtown. And I thought this is a, uh, that could extend into the downtown throughout our city and be viewed not only by students and faculty, but also by the citizens of Davis and out of town visitors, revealing the agriculture and cultural history of Davis. The city and the university could collaborate to become a destination point by foretelling these stories. In order to contribute to the economic growth of our city, the Chamber of Commerce could enlist local restaurants to develop menu items that reflect the cultural and ethnic communities and develop a unique food identity to go along with the stories of California and Davis agriculture. The Chamber could also work with the Farmer's Market, Friday's Art About, the Pence Gallery and the Artery to feature and incorporate such, such attractions as cooking demonstrations and displays and entertainment. Of course, this is a concept and not a reality, but the cultural heritage of California and Davis agriculture could be a means of linking and benefiting our university and our city together. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Dan. I get the bath cleanup today. <laughs> We've got a lot of innovation in food to be proud of in the city of Davis. Our farmer's market and our food co-op blazed a trail that many other communities are still following. The start of work on a new plan for downtown Davis, I believe, provides a great opportunity for us to both improve our economy and provide better and more interesting food choices for Davis residents and visitors. Both the farmer's market and the food co-op are both within the boundaries of the downtown planning area. Both draw a large number of out-of-town visitors to Davis. So we could think about what steps we as a city could take to have them linger a bit, hang around uh, after the, the morning hours, for example, of the farmer's market, and therefore put more cash in our coffers. So how exactly could we do this? We've got some real experts from the farmer's market the, the Visitors Bureau, UC Davis, and the co-op who could help figure this out. But I've got two ideas. One is in integrating a cafe or a restaurant into the 3rd and B building, perhaps in partnership with the Bicycle Hall of Fame. 
Now that the states said we get to keep the building, I think it's time to explore the option of creating a farm to fork restaurant there. I'm also intrigued by the Upper Crust Bakery move into the Radio Shack storefront uh, over near the co-op. Um, it, it strikes me that this could be the start of a, of a foodie community. Uh, we, we could encourage other businesses to spin off their, their operations into other locations in the city or downtown. And one last idea, which is we, after we finish it with our downtown plan, we're going to go to work on a general plan. Uh, some cities in California have started to ad adopt health community elements to their general plans. They could talk about such things as physical activity to, to, to prevent obesity, but could also deal with things like encouraging uh, more community gardens and more healthful eating. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, all of you. And now we'll move on to two questions that the candidates have not received. Uh, the third question is also two minutes, and we will begin with Larry Gunther. Um, okay. Share an instance of city decision-making process that you are familiar with and your evaluation of the effectiveness of that process. And I'll read that one more time. Okay. Share an instance of a city decision-making process that you are familiar with and your evaluation of the effectiveness of that process. There have been a lot of decisions made in the city since, <laughs> since I've been here. Um, one of the recent ones, I guess, um, that comes to mind, we're limited to one. OK. Um, I, think, uh, I think a good process that came up recently was, in fact, the Lincoln 40 project. Um, whether or not it's a project you like or don't like or voted for or didn't vote for or you know, thought, of, thought of in favor of. Um, I, think the, I think the commissions and their input were well heard. I think also the uh, community input was listened to and was heard. But this took a huge step from the applicant. And the applicant had to engage. They had to want to hear the input, and they had to want to incorporate that input into the final project. So a collaborative, community-based project is what I like to see. And I think they did a good job. And rewarding the good actors not rewarding the bad actors is a big part of what we can do going forward. Um, so yeah, that's what I like to see. I like to see community input, and I like to see that community input acted on. I like to see the citizen commissions, the community commissions, have their say and have that say incorporated into the final project. So I think, relatively speaking, that was a, that was a good project. Thanks. Great, thank you, Larry. That's, that's hard to go first. Okay, <laughs> Gloria. Can you read that question one more time? Um, no? Okay, I, I will. Um, okay. Sure. Share, share an instance of a city decision-making process that you are familiar with and your evaluation of the effectiveness of that process. Okay, so the evaluation of that effectiveness. Um, I think that what... Larry said about having community input is really important in any policy that we that the city puts forward. I think that the community should be reflected in any in any decision making that we that we do. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is the parcel tax decision. Tax decisions are difficult. And they're difficult for any community. Nobody likes to pay taxes. Everybody loves the things that come from them. But I think that in asking for consultation on the amount that the tax needed to be, and also thinking down the road. So I think it's really important that any decision that we make take into account how far that decision is going to go and and that that the decisions we make today are not going to be put on the generations that are going to come after 
words. And so I, I think that the effective, well, we'll find out if people vote on these taxes that were, that are put forward. But I do think that the process there was good. I think that they thought carefully about whether or not they were going to pass one or two taxes. And um, again, I, I think that that decision was really difficult. And those types of, dis of decisions are unpopular. And it's important for the city council to be brave going forward in making those decisions. Great. Thank you, Gloria. Luis. Uh, my issue is the issue of homelessness. Um, you know, last year, my son, who's a Boy Scout, Troop 139, he wrote an article on homelessness as, as one of his uh, civil engagement requirements. Uh, he interviewed Will Arnold, council member, and the article was published in the Davis Democratic Club. And so we had at home a lot of discussions about homelessness and, and a lot of questions about, you know, why is somebody uh, with a sign in front of a supermarket um, asking for money or food or whatnot. Um, so I think as parents, we, we, you know, I'm very careful how to carry out a conversation. And, you know, here in Davis, we're very compassionate. We're, we're caring people. And when I drive on I-80 and I see a tent along um, the tracks in I-80 or people sleeping on the street in our downtown area, um, so I think city council needs to be more intentional, more proactive, and as far as city decision making goes, we need to be better on serving people who sleep on the street, really, no matter what their issues are, uh, medical treatments, food, shelter. Uh, we need, the Davis community needs to really um, get together on this and you know have public support so that council members can move forward on this issue and that's what I like to see, you know, be more proactive, more intentional on, on helping our, our folks who don't have much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Mark. The process that I want to talk about is how we create new businesses in town. And the one I want to focus on is, is the discussions on, on the new hotels that were over the past couple of years, and specifically on the Hyatt House Hotel. The issues that I saw here was a, a process created by the city council and the city staff that was attempting to pick winners and losers. Rather than evaluating a, process, a project for its a, a pr appropriateness for the site, they were comparing different pro projects to see which one was better, and also trying to protect existing properties. We need to move away from this protectionist mindset and picking winners and losers and instead just allow businesses to develop. Bring new businesses in. Hotels, we need more of them in this town. We are losing revenue on a daily basis because we don't have them. The university is this massive generator of desire for hotels and if we don't have the space, we have to put people all around the, the, the region instead of in town and we lose the tax money. In the case of Hyatt House, it was a challenging position because it was, although it was a commercial property, zoned for commercial property, it was a different kind of prop, uh, business that was proposed to go into the site. That said, the developers were very good at trying to get engagement with the community, their immediate neighbors, and the neighbors, for the most part, refused to engage. That's an obstructionist attitude at, that is to prevent projects rather than to be involved in discussing the projects. And those were particular developers who were very good and a history of having, of responding to their engagement. So I want the city to be better and quicker at making decisions. Two years to make a hotel decision is far too long. We need to help businesses start so that we can have more opportunity for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ezra. Thank you. So the decision I want to talk about is the city's decision to um, join together with uh, Yolo County and Woodland uh, to launch a community choice um, aggregation uh, energy business uh, known as Valley Clean Energy. Why I think this was an effective and appropriate um, city decision making process is that one of the first things uh, that was done was to get together a um, 
group of, of experts, uh, of which uh, Davis is inordinately blessed, uh, and are some of the people I think are um, exceptionally well qualified to advise the city as to the, the appropriate form uh, and a nature of what that, um, that program might look like. Um, the other um, thing that I thought was exemplary was that the city looked to uh, solve a, a regional opportunity on a regional basis uh, and from the beginning really looked to craft uh, a, uh, an organization that was going to be, um, I guess, larger than Davis uh, by having YOLO, which has got a, a big agricultural load and is going to be very helpful in, in, uh, in the success of the business, uh, as well as Woodland, but has really left the door open to West Sacramento as well. Um, and I think the other reason why the uh, decision making was a positive one is I see this as a potentially ex excellent source of future revenue and also an instrument to bring energy um, to the ideals of the Davis community and to drive more sustainable energy uh, in our midst. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Mary Jo. I'm going to bring up the Sterling Project. Um, because that actually brought my attention so much to what uh, Davis needed to center its attention on, and that was planning, planning for the future. Uh, the Sterling Project uh, came under, um, came, came up all of a sudden, and was all of us, we realized, uh, those of us that lived in Rancho Yolo, that we had a, uh, something that we had to deal with across the street from us. Um, and I think the main, main things that uh, it brought up was that um, we weren't notified uh, properly and learned about it after the fact when it was first coming to the city council. That put us behind the eight ball kind of thing to really start acting uh, aggressively to see what was going on. And actually, the pro as the project developed, we were, we were very solicited by the developers to, uh, to support the project. And of course, we could not at that moment because it was way out of sorts for the general plan. I mean, t twice as dense, you know, high five-story five buildings, six-foot uh, story uh, parking garage. And so we didn't quite know what, how to react to it. And we kept working on it and working on it. And then, then, then um, it came down to the end of the project. And uh, they asked us to, um, to work with them to, um, to figure out what we could do, what they could do to make us support it. Well, that was going to be a very difficult decision for me, particularly because it meant the demolition of the Family First Campus. And the Family First Campus, if you have history in Davis, know how it developed and who it served. The closing of it was not the, pro not the fault of the children that were there or the staff. It was uh, the fault of a, of a nonprofit that was outside of the county uh, letting it disintegrate into what it became. Um, it, it basically, we finally did negotiate with the, with the, uh, the owners and we had to, um, we, we, we settled it. Thank, Thank you, you, Mary Jo. Dan. The instance I'll talk about is the recent city action to put a street and road tax, a parcel tax, on the ballot. And I think what it shows is both the strengths and the advantages of the city commission system and the limitations of that system. So the, the strengths were uh, our finance and budget commission had passed a series of motions over the last couple of years urging greater accountability over, over any t new tax measures. And we got some important provisions. Uh, for example, if the city diverts the money now going to streets and roads to other purposes, the tax rate under this measure automatically goes down to zero. There's room for the three commissions to review expenditures before they happen and accountability after the fact. But there is a limitation to what we were able to achieve, although we had some good things. What we also wanted was a balanced and comprehensive plan for solving the full $8 million fiscal problem that the city had. We don't have that. We've got a solution towards three of the eight on the ballot. Um, I think part of that limitation is the fact that you need someone on that city council with the fiscal expertise, and I have someone in mind, <laughs> who every day can be on that dais and make the motions to make change happen. That's what I'm running for. Thank you, Dan. I'll keep this 
Linda. <laughs> I get two microphones. Um, thank you. I'm looking at the process from coming at this from, I was, I've not been here for 30, 40 years. I've been here for 10 years. So I've been able to look at it both from somebody in Sacramento looking at, gosh, how does Davis make his decisions? How do they decide how they're going to do, de do development? And it's like, oh, gosh, it seems like there's a lot to it, and there's a lot of public participation, and people vote on everything. It's like, okay, I come here, and I see that. I've been attending the commission meetings. I've been attending the city council meetings. And talk about a robust public participation. Boy, do people show up. And boy, do they have things to say. But what I don't hear as much of are the voices of our, well, what I don't hear is that certain voices are not being heard. And those voices would be oftentimes our own commissioners, our volunteer commissioners. For example, a development comes before the, the, before the city, and it's going to go through Open Space Commission, it's going to go through planning, it's going to go through fiscal, it's going to go through social services, it's going to go through all of these. Oftentimes, these show up to them as an idea of, oh, I think I'd like to build this, but I'm not exactly sure. Why don't you tell me your ideas for affordable housing? Why don't you tell me your ideas about how we can best do this? Well, how about developer? You come to us with the more fleshed out projects so we know exactly what we're looking at here. Because we need to know. We have very expert commissions here, very expert commissioners on those commissions. They want to know. They want to put the time into seeing what is best for the city. So that when it gets through the planning commission on up to our city council, they know what they're voting on, and more importantly, when those decisions come before the voters, we know it's been fully vetted by the experts in town and by our city council. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Eric. Yeah, so uh, an issue I wanted to talk about actually was uh, particular to the work that I've done on the Bicycle and Transportation and Street Safety Commission. I've been serving on that commission for a number of years. And um, one of the issues that we recently tackled was what to do, what we can do as a city to help with the Unitrans budget shortfall that's kind of coming upon, upon them. So <clears throat> basically at this point we have sort of an issue with Unitrans where they're running out of funding and they're needing a little bit of additional support and help. So what we ended up doing was I led uh, the, the efforts to start up a subcommittee uh, within my uh, commission uh, and we took on the task of trying to provide recommendations through our subcommittee that we can then forward as official policy recommendations to our city council. Uh, so this involved conducting research. Uh, I did a lot of research uh, through my own work as a transportation scholar at the University of Transportation Studies, uh, ITS, um, uh, at campus. Um, and conducting leader uh, interviews with leaders within the community. Uh, and so this is actually a lot of the work that I did um, uh, in a previous time uh, in Afghanistan, doing a lot of work with community leaders, uh, reaching out to neighborhood and re religious elders and tribal elders, and kind of employing a lot of those same interpersonal dynamics and communications. Uh, and also um, collecting a lot of data from folks uh, that were just users of the system. So during my 50th anniversary bus tour uh, of, the, of the city of Davis on Unitrans, I talked to a lot of riders about that. What we ended up doing was producing a report that ended up having uh, you know, specific recommendations calling for granularity on an audit uh, that was being conducted by the university on uh, the Unitrans system to ensure we weren't going to be you know, missing that piece. Um, also proposing a number of pilot programs and pilot projects uh, and providing those recommendations to council, uh, such as having some folks in our business community uh, being able to sponsor stops and being able to sponsor uh, particular routes and services to be able to provide some of that additional revenue to help augment the suffering budget that we have with Unitrans. All of that together, we were able to tackle a problem and find a more effective way to move uh, the policy down the field, and I feel it went very well. Thank you, Eric. Okay, we have one more two-minute question. Again, the, the candidates have not heard this question. Um, we're going to begin with Luis. Ta and I'll read it twice. Take one issue in your platform and explain why you think it's important to the city of Davis and explain your plan to address the issue. So take one issue in your platform and explain why you think it's important to the city of Davis and explain your plan to address the issue. Luis. Yes, okay. Um, since I started campaigning last uh, October, I was the second person to announce my candidacy in the Davis Enterprise. I've been talking to a lot of 
residents, students, seniors, business owners downtown. I've been door to door downtown every day almost. Um, and tabling at the Davis Farmers Market, I've met many, many young families with children and saying that they just moved to Davis because of the quality schools, because of the quality community. Uh, very excited to be here, being part of the Davis community. And I can understand certainly why I was born here. I'm raising my own two children. I have a sixth grader at Cesar Chavez Elementary. I have a four-year-old daughter in preschool. This fall, she'll be in kindergarten. And so this is my, my native home. And so Davis is facing a housing crisis. We need to develop housing. We need smart planning, smart growth planning, smart housing. We need to convene realtors, developers, people, business leaders, and we all need, we are all, we are all stakeholders here, and we need to convene and establish partnerships and find ways of building homes for people to live in, and that's very important moving forward, especially for the future generations of Davisites. Uh, my children, your children, everybody. You know, I live here because it's a small town. I grew up in Yolo County. Um, a lot of people I've encountered, they live here because they enjoy the community, the small town flavor, the small town character. Um, that's why I'm here. I lived in New York City where I uh, completed a PhD at Columbia University. And now I'm here to raise my family and I'm part of this community, and when elected, I want to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Mark. The city now admits to an $8 million deficit on a roughly $50 million general fund. Um, I say admits to because they've denied that they had a deficit for several years, even though it's been obvious to those who are looking at the data that there, there's one existed, and we've got tens of, million dollar, tens of millions of dollars of unfunded obligations that we've created over the time. The city has to start paying its bills, and the way we need to do that is by increasing our revenues, not by taxation to making life more expensive for everybody, but by generating more business activity through economic development. The definition of economic development is to create opportunities for residents to improve their quality of life. And that's what we need to do, creating new jobs so that people can have a chance to improve their life and also so that the city can generate more revenues. City our size, if you compare to other university towns about our size, should have a general fund closer to $100 million, not $50 million. And the reason we don't is because we haven't allowed businesses to expand in town. Our latest general plan, which is now almost 20 years old, called for 200 new acres of commercial development. It was necessary, thought to be necessary 20 years ago, to, in order to, for the city to have enough revenue to pay its bills. We didn't do it. We didn't expand at all. We haven't made the effort to create the business that we need to pay the bills that we've run up. If we want to do that, address our challenges now, rather than passing it off to our children and grandchildren to pay for, it's time for us to start implementing the plans that we've had over the years. Ever since the first core area plan in 1961, we've talked about building business, and we haven't done it. It's time to start doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ezra. Well, it's a tough choice. Thank you. <laughs> it's a tough choice to choose uh, one, uh, one particular issue. Um, I think I'm going to go with uh, fiscal sustainability. Um, I think uh, my plan uh, to address fiscal sustainability is to look at the revenue side of the equation uh, and look for the opportunities. And I think the, the Valley Clean en Energy is going to be a, a key part of, of bridging the revenue gap. I think looking at how we better harness the, the UCD um, professors that are creating great um, intellectual property, et cetera, and, and creating an incubator for commercialization of that IP uh, is something that I want to turn my attention to as somebody who has, who has started uh, two, two businesses along the lines of new technology. On the, but fiscal sustainability is, is two parts. First is on the revenue side, and the second is on the cost side. 
Uh, and I think well, what I want to look at on the cost side are, are two things mainly. One is, are we operating efficiently? And, we t and I talk in my literature around the, the, um, the benefits of um, benchmarking and comparing how we're doing things to how other comparable cities like San Luis Obispo or Corvallis are, are doing things and make sure we're efficient. Uh, but the other uh, element is trying to control unnecessary costs. Now, one of the questions I have is given we're going out to the community for more, uh, for, to raise taxes, why is it that we added 15 new roles uh, to a base of about 423, which is, you know, in rough terms, uh, around three to four million dollars of annual additional liability? So if we didn't hire those folks, we'd already be halfway to the eight million dollar shortfall. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Mary Jo. Well, my main platform and the reason why I'm here is because I've witnessed in regards to the, some of the issues that I've been involved with, uh, the cannery and, and also the Sterling Project, the need for tw uh, more planning. Uh, we are basically doing piecemeal planning in regards to uh, look at the way our general plan reads and our zoning. Our, regulations are and I I would like to uh, my platform really would like to see the uh, update of our general plan and starting with a citizens review commission committee to really look at with the housing needs of Davis and then with the housing needs of Davis uh, uh, looked at and sort of delineated then to add, sort of redo the general plan to reflect those housing needs then to go forward and find out if we can, how we can actually implement those housing needs. And that might mean that we need to look at our, our, our land and how we, it's so expensive that we cannot build on it homes that we kind of need. And those are the ones for the middle income folks and, uh, that want to move here. And I would like to you know, put forth that uh, this is a, definitely will be in review in two years when we look at Measure J and Measure ARB. But in that, in that regards, we can, before that, we can really sit down and come together and actually say where Davis wants to be in 20 years and how we get there and how, what, what we're able to compromise with. And I believe it, that we come together and we make those decisions and go forward. We can't keep going what we're doing now or else we're all we're going to be is a, a, is a community of very high-income homes and those that can qualify for the affordable uh, uh, affordable income homes. And uh, I want to get that middle back, the, the homes that we were able to buy when we moved here 40, 30, even 20 years ago, and then uh, be able to have p our better c diversity of population. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Dan. I'd like to talk about how I would like to change and improve the relationship between the city of Davis and the UC Davis campus. Any day now, the campus is going to re release a new plan that, by their numbers, will increase the campus population by 24% over the next 10 or 12 years. The campus is at the hub. It's an it's a, a important part of the vibe of this community. And I think the city is very important to the campus. But that next wave of campus growth will aggravate the budget and housing problems that we're all very familiar with. We need to create an effective two-way working relationship, like Santa Cruz has done, like Berkeley has done. The city of Berkeley gets a $2 million a year revenue stream from the Berkeley campus. And it's an effective two-way relationship because their, their working together has resulted in opportunities for additional student housing and economic development in downtown Berkeley. We need to cut the same kind of deals get the same kind of advantages that these other college communities have been provided. I think we can really help each other. Uh, I would want to know in negotiations with campus of how we deal with the next wave of growth, what can we do to help them succeed? I went to that campus. I'm a diehard Aggies basketball fan. I'm a little disappointed by what happened in the first round of the playoffs. But I really think that we can look out for each other's interests and be a stronger city and a better campus all at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Linda. The number one issue on all of my materials deals with housing and deals with providing 
entry level housing for our community here. I remember when I came out of college, I was renting a room. After that, I was in an apartment. After that, when I, with my girlfriend and I, we were able to get a 900 square foot home in Sacramento. We all start from somewhere, and from that home, was able to get to a larger home and to the place I'm at now in Davis. But we are lacking here in Davis are those entry level homes. We don't have any more those split lot duplexes that many of us started out with here in Davis. We don't have any more available multi-unit housing for folks to get their start at here. I would like to go forward by working with our developers, working at the, looking at the projects, coming online and saying, show us more housing that is in that size of the 1,100 square foot, the 900 square foot, they want us, certain developers would like us to downsize from our big homes into other types of homes in, over on Covell. That's great, but I'm not gonna downsize from a 2200 to another 2200 square foot home. I might downsize into something half that size. Multi-unit housing is essential here, not only for our students in town, but also for other working professionals coming into Davis and who want to stay in Davis. It can be downtown, it can be other parts of town. We all are going to share in enhanced housing here in Davis. I too would like to be looking at the UC and how we can work together in providing that housing. Is it gonna take a little push? Probably. Who's the best person to deal with doing that push? Probably an attorney who's quite willing to take on the big guys. And I will do that with regard to UC Davis. But come on, let's all come together and provide entry level housing for all of us here in town. Thank you, Linda. Eric. So with the community that is comprised of over 50% renters, and as the only individual before you who is a current renter, who's living paycheck to paycheck, who understands the realities of over half of this town that is struggling to access the Davis dream, my first and foremost priority is to represent and ensure that we are not going to lose the rest of those within that space to other places around uh, outside of our community. So bolstering our renter protections is very important to me. Uh, it's something that you know I feel on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's something that uh, I'm going to be fighting for every single day while on the council. Uh, and that also kind of gets to a larger point of ensuring that we can provide the steps and the pathway uh, for our young professionals and those who are falling outside of the grasp of being able to be a part of the Davis Dream and attain the Davis Dream, giving them the tools that they need to be able and the, the infrastructure that they need to be able to succeed. So this comes into play when we're talking about uh, upgrading our fiber optics and uh, promoting community broadband internet. This comes into play with uh, proposing different initiatives for some of our project proponents and those that are willing, willing to build in our community. Perhaps what we can start doing is working on sort of proposing initiatives for micro homes, for accessory dwelling units, for uh, setting up and uh, incentivizing those that are, are have the privilege of owning land within the town, giving them the opportunity and the incentives through the city to be able to uh, you know, subdivide some of their land, be able to provide accessory dwelling units, uh, to be able to help uh, provide some of that pathway and help pitch in as part of a community to solve the problem. This is gonna take all of us uh, standing forward and standing up to take care of these issues and it's very important that we're able to make sure that we can have that pathway uh, for housing and pathway, especially for our renters who are feeling the pinch and are feeling the struggle most uh, within our community. Thank you, Eric. Larry. Um, so, uh, I'm having a problem. I don't like to think of, uh, of any one issue in a vacuum. And I think the best solutions are elegant solutions that really address more than one issue. So um, thinking about this while the others were talking, I think the downtown is a really good analogy microcosm of the city as a whole. So I'm on the Downtown Plan Advisory Commission and we hear a lot of things, I've been hearing a lot of things just as a citizen about, you know, adding people living downtown, not having so much focus on the automobile, being able to walk and drive and, and of course the concern, everybody's concerned about the vacant storefronts. Um, so this is, this is an area where I think a great solution addresses 
if not all the problems, and gave us a lot of the big ones. So if we do the downtown right, or if we do development anywhere in Davis right, we get housing that people can afford. If the, de if the housing is designed so people can afford it, if it's smaller square footage, as people have said, to bring the cost down, um, and if storefronts are filled, if we, so getting those storefronts filled with local businesses, um, putting, redeveloping downtown so that, or the, and the rest of Davis, so that we get the multi-use out of each square foot. So that helps the housing situation. That helps the economic development situation, especially if we ensure that these developments actually pay for themselves. That's a whole other topic for a whole other day, but... Um, it reduces our carbon footprint. If people can live downtown, walk to the train station, and if they don't have to commute to their job outside of Davis, but actually work in Davis, it can also improve ta -da, our quality of life. We have people walking around downtown. We have people living downtown. That brings more and better businesses downtown. Five, four, three, fade to black. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Gloria. Okay, so everyone already took all the good things. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that uh, our relationship with the university is key to everything we do. The university drives how many people live here. They drive, you know, uh, the cost of our housing up. Uh, they drive our economic development. So the, uh, it's absolutely imperative that our relationship with the university um, be productive for us and for them. And I, I think that we, we, we need to partner. We need to partner with them as, um, what was it, Dan, down there, was talking about uh, the, there are models. There's Berkeley, there are other university towns, and so we can sort of decide which way we want our model to go. But definitely, I think that we, we need to drive our economic development up. It is um, the thing that is going to help us financially, be financially solvent. Uh, it's probably the most important thing uh, for us to, to do. Um, also, with that, we have to expand our tax base, and expanding our tax base is not just businesses, it's also building more homes. We do need to build more homes. It, that is, that's sort of a, a given, and how we do that is going to be really important. Um, how we build our housing in Davis is something that people are the most vocal about, and I think that uh, we have to be very collaborative in how we do that, and we also have to, again, be very brave in how we do that. Thank you, Gloria. Okay, we are at our final question. Uh, this will be a one-minute question, and we'll start with Ezra. And this is one minute for your closing statement. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank all of you for getting involved. I think the community involvement is going to be key to our success uh, in the future, tackling our collective challenges. I think it's fantastic. I understand from the Davis uh, City website that we are the most educated community in the country. Uh, and I think that's also one of our great strengths. Um, I believe everything I read on the internet. <laughs> um, but non nonetheless, um, the secret to our tackling these problems, these are not just Davis problems, these are, these are nationwide, these are California-wide problems, housing affordability, fiscal sustainability, um, but I believe, the, again, the, the secret will be um, working together as a community to solve them. I believe that my values, having grown up here, and my education and my business experience uh, can help make a difference for you on the council, and I would like to ask for your vote today. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra Beeman. Mary Jo Bryan. I also want to thank you all. We had no idea how many people were going to show up, and this is really wonderful. It reminds me back when the League of Women Voters would have uh, candidates' forums, and they were packed, and there was no room, and this is great to see this on there. Um, I, just want to, uh, I just want to say that um, 
I have a great amount of experience with my 44 years of being here in Davis, and I have a lot of resources also that I hope to bring to the city council. Um, I know how the city works, and I'm ready to serve, and to serve you well, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Dan Carson. Today, we enjoyed a conversation about what we each would do as a city council member if we were fortunate enough to be elected. What I think it's also important to talk about is about how we can work together as a community to make progress on the serious challenges we face. We are an engaged and passionate community, but finding agreement amongst our passions sometimes is very difficult. Just watch council some Tuesday night. I would reach out to listen and learn from every perspective. Not everyone feels comfortable going down to City Hall and testifying at City Council meetings. I promise to go to every neighborhood and to every segment of our community to understand how City Hall can work for them. I will use the full depth of the experience I've had in four decades of a professional career to build common ground and mutual benefit so that we can go forward. Please vote for me for the City Council. I'll work hard to ensure we remain committed to sustainability, family, and education for generations to come. Thank you, Dan. Linda Dios. This has been a wonderful experience to see all of you out here and I guess others who are watching online. We care in Davis. We are passionate in Davis about what type of community we, we want to have here. I am passionate about representing everybody as to the best of my, abil my ability here in Davis. I will always strive to maintain and build upon these passions to protect the Davis that we all do love by maintaining my independence, by making sure that the process is transparent so that all of us know who is involved, what they are involved for, and why they are involved. I would be honored to have your voice, have your vote, and to be your voice. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Eric Goods. Thank you, everybody, for taking your time out of your day to, to listen to us and to be here with us today. Um, so for my service overseas in Afghanistan uh, with the U.S. Army uh, as an intelligence and operations officer, uh, for my work here in the community working on criminal justice reform, drug policy reform, uh, social justice in many different respects, for my research at the Institute of Transportation Studies and with the Campus Travel Survey, for my work with youth communities and other communities, around this community in this region. I feel that I have the necessary qualifications, experience, expertise, and passion to help each and every one of you get to that much closer to the Davis dream that we all know and love. We have a big job ahead of us. We have a lot of work to do. And I have the passion, dedication, energy, enthusiasm, and vitality to be able to help all of us reach that Davis dream and ensure each one of us has a seat at the table in Davis. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Eric. Larry Gunther. Um, hi. Uh, public comment's going to start as soon as we're done. Um, most of what the City Council does, in my experience, relates to finance and land use planning. But how we affect those changes has a, a big impact on carbon footprint, on social justice, quality of life. We are very fortunate in Davis to have a super active community and to have uh, a commission system filled with intelligent problem solving people. Really listening to the members of the community and the stakeholders and building a collaborative process to make a quality end result is what I'm about. There are a lot of decisions to be made. Uh, we've got an uptown, uptown, downtown, plan, update, general plan, update, legalizing cannabis, renewing measure R, all these things are coming up. We've got a lot of work to do, and this is a great time to be in Davis. This is the dream phase of the remodel, when we get to decide what it's going to look like for the next 100 years. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Gloria Partida. All right, so it's obvious that um, you have a lot of very passionate uh, people to choose from here and um, I have had a lot of community involvement my community involvement has provided me experience in finding resources collaborating 
having hard conversations, and making tough decisions. My experience as a scientist has taught me to make those decisions on evidence. And my experience as a nonprofit founder, small business owner, have taught me to balance the bottom line and maintain quality and integrity. I look forward to sharing this experience with my community. And I invite anyone to please contact me if you have further questions. And also stop by my table and talk to Tracy. She's, she's really good. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria. Luis Rios. Hi. What do I bring to the table as city council member? Uh, I work in state government for over 12 years. I'm a fiduciary officer, a steward for the state of California at a state agency, California Department of Education. My duties include contract administration, budget planning, approving expenditures. I manage over $6 million worth of contracts. That means I be strongly believe in ethics, transparency, trust, accountability. I interface with Department of Finance, Department of General Services. I consult legal counsel on matters, terms and conditions that I easily understand. I r really understand state government. That's what I bring to to the table as a candidate, and I look forward to serving you honorably, with integrity, hard work, and thank you. I look forward to speaking to you afterwards. I have UC Davis college students who are there to answer your questions, and I'll be there myself. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Mark West. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for my colleagues up here. I learn a lot listening to everybody, and it's fun to have this conversation. Um, my parents came to town when they were students. They stayed, raised their family, loved the place, loved the community. I grew up here. I went away for school, came back when my kids were ready for school, raised a family, really two of them. Our two birth daughters are gone, and now we have four adopted kids that we're, we're raising as well. Um, I want Davis to be a place where you can do that where you can grow up here or come to school here and fall in love and stay and create a life for yourself and a life for your family. I think we've lost that and I think it's time for us to get back to that. We need to do it through creating opportunity for people. We need to move away from the protectionist mindset of I've got mine and I don't want anyone else to touch it and get to a, one, a mindset where we are creating chances for others, for everybody to improve their quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I want to thank all the candidates and thank uh, Civ Energy, Leslie Hunter, Bob Fung. I just want to make uh, uh, two quick announcements. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Davis Media Access. You, you can see their cameras here. Uh, they're filming the event. It, you, you'll be able to see it on the internet or at uh, DCTV. Um, if you don't know, Davis Media Access is the nonprofit community media center serving the Yolo County. Its mission is to enrich and strengthen the community by providing alternatives to commercial media for local voices, opinions, and creative endeavors. For more than 30 years, DMA has produced voter education pro programming for races ra ranging from school board to Congress. Um, so that's my first thing. The second thing is that um, if you came in through another door, you might not know that we're taking questions from the audience. Uh, there's three, five, three by five cards in the back. Um, if you fill that out, we'll post them uh, on the Civ Energy website for the candidates to respond to. So uh, we have refreshments for you back there, and then uh, you can take your refreshments and go and talk to the candidates. Thank, thanks for attending.